Okay, so uh, what I have just given all of you um, is a bibliography that lists the sources that I consulted before today's con uh, discussion. And when we get to the research paper towards the end of the semester, this will give you a starting point, right, for your own research. Right? You will know, you know, you know, on the one hand, it's about transparency on my part, right, these aren't all my ideas, I got them from somewhere, and these are the sources I used. But it's also to help you when you have to do research later, right? All of these sources are available in our library or library databases, or, or through the USG library. Um, so the audio piece that I'm playing right now um, is an Aeolian harp that is stationed kind of like up on the south coast of Ireland. Uh, does anybody know what an Aeolian harp is? Yes, Jess. Do you want me to simply explain what it is? Yeah, if you know what it is, yeah. Yeah, um, but the thing itself is essentially just, it's a wind harp. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. So an Aeolian harp is just a harp, you know, or, you know, some any kind of stringed instrument that you set up, and it's meant to be played just by having the wind blow through it, right? So the reason that I am playing this is because this is often used uh, by romantic poets and artists as a kind of metaphor for artistic sensibility, right? That the artist is like an Aeolian harp who is merely taking in impressions and kind of you know, vibrating to the wind as it were. Did right? you watch and wonder if Gal Gadot quickly transformed herself from an average oh, actor? shut up. What's that symbolism for? <laughs> What's that? What's that symbolism for? Uh, that is symbolism for uh, the uh, aggressive nature of contemporary capitalism. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing, uh, there is nothing that an ad cannot intrude upon. Um, okay, so um, I did ask you today to come up with a couple of things for the group timeline that we're putting together, right? So what all have you got? Question. Yeah, Bethany, sure. Um, were we supposed to use the readings from today or from general? Or no, you could do uh, just like do, just uh, do your own research, right? So you could just you could just look stuff up online, you know, whatever, right? Like you didn't have to do like deep source research. or just looking for a couple of examples of things. Um, I found um, that Wordsworth composed his most ambitious poem today called "Descriptive Sketches." Okay. In 17, it was written in 1971, 1972, but it was published in 1793. Okay. Um, it better illustrated his vein of protest in his belief in political freedom. Okay. Wordsworth, descriptive sketches. Okay. 1791 to 1793. Okay. Great. And, um, with that was published um, an evening walk. Um, it okay. was addressed to his sister. Um, what they are basically saying is that it was romantic, although it was a poem for his sister. So, okay. It was a romantic poem for nature lovers. Gotcha. All right. Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, John Keats. Um, he. Uh, he <clears throat> published Lania okay. in 1817, I think it was. Um, it was the last of the four metrical romances. It seemed to say that passionate love is an illusion and an enchantment ultimately destructive. Okay. So, right. That's all. Alex. Uh, one of them was uh, the letters from William Blake to Dr. Tressler. Um, okay. These two letters were written by William Blake, who was picturing Dr. John Tressler, and influential West Priest and publisher. Um, basically, Tressler had complaints, though, that his work was, that uh, Blake's work was too fantastical, and uh, he, this, his response was basically considered a stern defense of the imagination and the creative spirit. Okay. Um, 
also have uh, The Nightmare, a painting by Henry Fuselli. Henry Fuselli, yeah, okay. Um, the Strange Painting by Henry Fuselli depicts a, depicts a woman, woman drapes, uh, draped across the bed with a hairy, hairy uh, incubus sitting on top of her, staring menacingly at the viewer. Okay. Um, and the head of Black Mary can be seen over the two. Um, and basically, um, the combination of horror, sexuality, and death uh, ensures the image is not no uh -huh. It's an example of gothic horror. Okay. What's, what's the year on that? Uh, uh, 1781. 1781. Okay. I'll actually pull that up in a second so that people can see it. And what else? And um, The Slave Ship by William Turner. Okay. Um, 1840. Um, it depicts the ocean beneath a uh, stormy sky that's lit up with red and yellow as if on fire. Um, Turner hoped that this would inspire Prince Albert to be more to combat uh, slavery around the, world, around the globe. Okay. The slave ship is a little late for the period that we're talking about right now. But, um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but Turner was definitely uh, certainly um, influenced by romantic aesthetics. Yeah, Carolyn. Okay. Jess. Okay. Um, there was a strong Puritan belief. I didn't paint a year. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I really didn't paint it to a year at that point. Um, uh -huh. But I was reading on it, and there's a strong Puritan belief in the Romantic era. era. Okay. In other parts of the world, you know, some things were really focused on by Christ. Even with the scarlet letter, right? Pardon? The scarlet letter, I can't speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was a lot of things were based on that kind of time period. Okay. I think that you are mixing up British Romanticism and American Romanticism, which they're slightly different things. And American Romanticism comes along later. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Um, uh, you know, that'll be less of an issue with Victorianism because there isn't really a Victorian period uh, in the United States. But yeah, uh, romantic, British Romanticism influences American Romanticism, but they're, yeah, they're, they're not quite the same thing. Oh, okay. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit more deeply what British Romanticism is about, where it comes from, and what it's concerned with uh, today. Um, but yeah, so let's actually, let's call up the paintings that uh, Alex mentioned. The Fuseli painting is particularly interesting. And we're going to turn around. wants to cooperate today. Okay, so we'll start with the nightmare. Um, and one of the things that makes this particularly interesting um, is the way it demonstrates the reaction against neoclassicism. Now we talked about neoclassicism last time. Does anyone remember, or you know, could maybe consult your notes about what neoclassical art was about? Balance, harmony, rationality, yes.
And one thing that you would certainly not find in neoclassical art is any sort of supernatural imagery, right? So the fact that the woman is kind of draped across the bed unevenly, that many of the, you know, the colors are dark and muted, in a lot of ways, you know, the horse here is kind of almost suggested rather than actually kind of brought out. And the fact that she's got this little monster squatting on her chest, right? What these indicate is kind of like a return of the supernatural and the irrational into art. And these are things that the romantics are going to play with. Now this is the other painting that Alex mentioned, uh, The Slave Ship by William Turner. And this again, kind of like uh, what we see just in terms of aesthetic imagery here, right? How orderly or balanced does this look to you? Yeah, I mean, again, like the images are kind of suggested rather than really outlined, right? We can see kind of almost like the silhouette of a ship back here. You know, we can see uh, maybe seabirds, maybe human forms in the choppy waves, right? But yeah, one thing that I want to get across here is that <clears throat> romantic art prizes the irrational over the rational. Or at least the irrational processed by the rational mind, right? Um, whereas neoclassicism was concerned primarily with balance. And this isn't coming out of nowhere. We talked a little bit about sensibility last time. Does anybody remember uh, what we said about sensibility? What do you remember about sensibility? What was sensibility? Exactly, yes. Susceptibility to sense impressions. Right, that the thing that made the artist was the susceptibility to sensory input, right? That you were able to take inputs from your senses and transform them into something beautiful that would have emotional resonance with people, right? And that you're able to imagine the way other people would experience sensory stimuli, right? Remember, we talked a little bit about those theories of moral sentiments, right? That philosophers like Adam Smith and David Hume argued that <clears throat> Our ethical, like our sense of ethics, our sense of morality, derive from our ability to imagine other people's sense impressions, right? That we wanted to do things that would give, cause other people pleasure and not cause them pain because we could, we could uh, imagine what it would be like to be in their shoes, right? Okay, so let's take all of this as our starting point when we're talking about romantic aesthetic theory, right? Which we're then going to try to apply to the poems that we're going to be reading for next time. So, I'm guessing that you guys probably had some difficulty with what you read for today, right? It's a little dense. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the, the language is sometimes a little difficult to get through, right? So, Let's start with what questions you guys have about what you read for today, right? Was there anything in particular, apart from the language, that hung you, that hung you up? Or do you want a clarification on? It was just the language. It was the, the language was the difficulty? Did you feel like you just couldn't get anything out I of it? I had to read things over and over and just didn't mm -hmm. try to, and then read the question and try to make sense of it with 
Uh huh. Which some of it still didn't make sense, but. Okay. But the questions helped a little? It did help a little, yeah. Okay. But if I, after I read it a few times. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Were you able to identify any kind of common concerns or patterns or language that these writers shared? I feel like I was reading the Bible. Okay, why did you feel like you were reading the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> because of the language. I just felt okay. like I was reading the Bible and I was like, just looking for it. A lot of the love has been so so forth. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, as the eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I understand it, but. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, you know, I mean, that, that is actually, you know, that's a good observation because a lot of these writers are actually borrowing their prose style, whether they're personally religious or not, from the King James Bible, right? Now, they're not necessarily doing this consciously, but because the King James Bible was the official uh, scripture of the Anglican Church, they would have all been raised with it, right? So its language and its cadences kind of seep into everyday forms of expression, even things like letter writing. I didn't know they were talking with someone, someone, I can't remember which, which one it was, but one of them was talking about Raphael, and uh -huh. they were talking about Raphael, and 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 they were talking and one thing that's important to note about Blake, and one thing that makes him unique amongst these other writers, is that Blake is a poet and a visual artist. Right? His primary occupation is as an engraver. But he also um, made, uh, paints watercolors, um, and his books were always printed, um, accompanied with an engraved art plate. Right? So every poem, is you know engraved in a plate um, alongside uh, a picture, right? That illustrates the theme of the poem. So that doesn't really come through in a letter here, but it's something that when we start looking at his poetry will um, will become more clear. So apart from that kind of shared uh, King James Bible vocabulary, did you guys notice any other kind of shared language? or shared terms across all of these? Okay, imagination pops up a lot, right? Do they all seem to mean the same thing when they talk about imagination? Yeah, there are some differences, right? Between what each of these guys means when they talk about imagination. And they, some of them make distinctions between forms of imagination that the others don't, right? So one of the issues that we see with these writers, one of the, the differences we see is a generational difference, right? We're looking at guys who are writing across three different generations, right? Blake is the oldest. He's born in 1757. Wordsworth is born in 1770. His friend Coleridge in 1772. William Hazlitt in 1778. Percy Shelley in 1792. And Keats, the youngest, in 1795. So, yeah, we can divide these guys up really into kind of three generations, right? Starting with Blake, then we can look at Wordsworth, Coleridge, and Hazlitt as a cluster. They're all around the same age. And Shelley and Keats make up a third cluster, right? A third generation here. So romanticism as a movement, right, 
does grow and change because as we're, you know, as, I'm, as we're demonstrating here, right, it spans at least three generations of writers. Um, and Shelley and Keats, right, um, are not only the youngest of this group, but they also both die very young. Shelley dies in a boating accident at the age of 29, and Keats uh, is dead of tuberculosis at 25. So, you know, they accomplished a lot in very short lives, right? Now, <clears throat> When we look at Blake, and I think this first letter on sight and vision, the letter to Dr. John Trussler, is probably the more important for understanding um, his theory of art. Um, what does he seem to, how does he, how, how does he seem to define imagination? What does he seem to think imagination is? Or what does he relate it to? Blake, Blake, yeah, William Blake. Imagination was the way we see things. Okay. We see things differently. That's a lot. Okay. Um, so the way we see things. Okay. So can we try to dig a little bit more deeply into that? Can we explain what we mean by the way we see things? Okay. Somebody sees it one way and you see it another. Like oh. so, he said okay. something about how somebody looks at it in a way that God made it. In, in, that, or that's what I kind of thought what he meant. Okay, yeah, so he, yeah, he is talking about a kind of vision here, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that he does say, seem to say is that the way we see things is in some, in some sense relative, right? Mm -hmm. So if we look on page 173 here, right? He says, I see everything I paint in this world, but everybody does not see alike. To the eyes of a miser, a guinea is more beautiful than the sun, and a bag with the, worn with the use of money has more beautiful proportions than a vine filled with grapes. Does everybody know what a guinea is, by the way? Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a um, chicken Sort of, sort of. No, no, a guinea is a gold coin. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, well, there are guineas that aren't. Like there, yes, you're thinking of a guinea, guinea. hen, yes, yeah. which, is, yeah, which is a kind of fowl that, yes, people eat. <laughs> yeah, my bad. But no, yeah, um, a guinea, and you know, um, this actually, like, let's, because uh, this actually does come up a bit, particularly with Blake. It might be a good idea to short, briefly divert and talk a little bit about what British money was like pre-1971, uh, because that does become an issue here. So, the people, so you understand like, what the relative values of things are, right? So, so Britain is on a decimal currency like us now, right? You've got 100 pence in one pound. Um, a pound is usually these days worth about a buck fifty. Um, this was not the case at the turn of the 19th century. Right? So prior to 1971, The major units of currency were a pound, the shilling, and pence. So the pound is represented rendered by the kind of stylized L shape. A shilling, S with a period, and pence, a D with a period. A pound is made up of 20 shillings. A shilling is made up of 12 pence. A pence in like early 19th century money is worth about 14 cents. A shilling is about a buck 65. 
and a pound is about 34, uh, 33, 34, uh, $33. A guinea is a pound plus a little bit more. And would have been worth about $35. So when Blake is talking about doing a painting, like charging 30 guineas to this guy for the work he wants him to do, he's charging him about $1,050. Right? Essentially, you know, what, what he's saying is like, this work that you want me to do is not going to come cheap, right? But yeah, when he says that a guinea is more beautiful to a miser than anything else, He's talking about this gold coin that's worth about $35. And yeah, this is actually, this is stuff that's going to probably come up later, so file this away and uh, remember it. All right, so to the eyes of a miser, a guinea is more beautiful than the sun, and a bag worn with the use of money has more beautiful proportions than a vine filled with grapes. The tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing that stands in the way. Some see nature all ridicule and deformity, and by these I shall not regulate my proportions. And some scarce see, see nature at all. But to the eyes of the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. As a man is, so he sees. So, imagination seems to be something you've either got or you don't, right? And he seems to relate it in some way to poetic and spiritual inspiration. Right, the person with imagination is seeing a different, a better, and a more true world than the person without it. Kind of seeing a heightened reality, right? And he is accusing Dr. Trussler of being one of these people who doesn't see this, right? In a kind of backhanded way. Right. Clearly, given that you don't understand the design I proposed for you, right, you don't get this. Right? You are not a man of imagination. Now, what other writer that we looked at do we see making a big deal out of imagination? OK, um, give me an example. Where's Wordsworth talk about imagination? Okay, let's go to um, the uh, preface to lyrical ballads on page 314. And what he's trying to do here is provide a definition of poetry that explains his method, right? So can I get somebody to read for us under emotion, recollection, and tranquility, starting with I have said that poetry. I have said that poetry Thanks, Alex. Is, no problem. Um, I have said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion, recollected, and tranquility. The emotion is contemplated till, by a species of a reaction, the tranquility gradually disappears. And an emotion kindred to that, which was before the subject of contemplation, is generally produced. And does itself actually exist in the mind. OK, so let's try to break this down a little bit, right? What is words? So where does poetry come from? Your mind. OK, from your mind, right? 
It comes from feeling, yes. It starts with emotion, right? But does he seem to think that you can actually sit down and write a poem when you are still experiencing that emotion? No, no it's recollected and tranquility. Exactly. That recollected and tranquility part is the important qualifier here, right? It is based on powerful emotion, but you have to sit down and process that emotion in order to make poetry out of it, right? It's like if you get broken up, you have to sit a minute to, to process <laughs> that emotion. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, before you could like write a breakup song or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's for this Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you gotta get broken up first. Uh huh. You can get mad, and then you can get upset, and then exactly. you can write the good song. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Again, I, this this is probably the first time I've ever heard Wordsworth and Taylor Swift yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> compared <laughs> this way. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it, if it comes together uh -huh. and it makes you think of it, then it absolutely, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it makes it makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the whole process for Wordsworth is basically emotion, recollected, and tranquility. And this is going to provide the basic model for romantic poetry that we're going to be looking at next time. Right? So there's a guy by the name of M.H. Abrams. Um, is one of the most influential uh, literary scholars of his or any generation. Um, he just died a couple of years ago at the age of like 106 or something. You know, um, taught at Cornell forever. Um, he wrote a book in 1957 called The Mirror and the Lamp, which was a study of romanticism. And in that book, he describes what he calls the greater romantic lyric. So a lyric is basically any poem that's not narrative, right? It doesn't tell a story. A lyric doesn't tell a story. A lyric um, is just, you know, it expresses um, an emotion or describes an object or some such thing, right? So it's any poem with no plot is a lyric. And the basic model for the romantic lyric, according to Abrams, is observation. meditation, and application. Right, so the poet observes something, usually something in nature, right? This gets, this gets him thinking or remembering, and then he applies these ideas from the meditation to his current condition, right? So it's a kind of outside, inside, outside motion. So we have in the observation, whatever sparked the emotion, right? The inside part, the meditation, is recollecting the emotion in tranquility and processing it, right? And then back outside, right, that's making something out of these meditations. Like transmutation? Yeah. Exactly. You're, 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 getting, you're taking these raw, like this kind of raw sensory data, right? And you're processing it and then making something out of it that recalls the feeling it gave you, right? that kind of brings that feeling back to you, but without the intensity of the original emotion that you couldn't have processed into art, right? So Wordsworth's theory kind of gets more or less unconsciously absorbed by pretty much every other romantic, or like most of them do this to some extent, right? Even, you know, Coleridge, uh, Wordsworth's best frenemy, um, <clears throat> with whom he will have num a number of conflicts later in life, 
um, and Shelley and Keats, uh, who both tend to think of Wordsworth as a boring old fart, um, internalize this method of composition to a degree, right? So this is one thing that links uh, most romantic aesthetics together. But to return to this idea of the imagination, right? So we saw Blake use a word with imagination. Right? He uses the word fancy alongside of it. And does he seem to differentiate between these two words at all? Does he seem to mean anything different by fancy? Or does he seem to be using them more or less interchangeably? Pardon? Stomp, stomp and fancy. Imagination and fancy. Oh. <laughs> so these it, two. It can be used interchangeably, yes, but fancy is something you wish to have or want. Yeah. Or imagination. Okay, we, we often tend to use the word fancy um, to express desire, right? Okay. Yeah, so you know, I, I, I fancy this, or Brits use this more than we do, right? You know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I fancy this person, or you know, I fancy this particular object, right? Um, but yeah, fancy and imagination um, kind of both come from different, uh, different root words, right? So imagination comes from the Latin imaginatio. And fancy comes from the Greek fantasein. And both are concerned with image making, right? With the making of images, the creation of images, right? Conjuring up images that aren't there. Fantasein is also the root of our word fantasy. And in the 18th century, these two words are used mostly to mean the same thing. So Coleridge right, Samuel Taylor Coleridge in the Biographia Literaria is um, probably the first writer in English to make any real distinction between them. So if we can turn for a minute to, and of course I lost my place here because that's what I do. Um, 496. So can I read, uh, can I get somebody to read for me uh, page 496 on the imagination or esomplastic power? Just those two paragraphs there. Thank you. So this is all pretty hard to parse, right? Alex, do you think you have a notion here of what's going on? Um, or what the difference here is? I think I kind of get it. I don't know how to explain it, though. OK. Which does Coleridge seem to think is the superior Yeah. 
absolutely imagination he regards as superior to fancy, right? Yeah. Like, just the language he uses about fantasy is like, uh -huh. it's just no other than a mode of memory emancipated from, yeah, just like. Yeah, yeah, okay, so let's, let's think of it like a, mem a mode of memory emancipated from the order of time and space. So what does that mean? Again. Memory emancipated from the order of time and space. What does that mean? What's what 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 is like what is what do you do with fancy, according to Coleridge? So both of these are concerned with the way we take in and process sense impressions, right? Yeah. If, we're if we're using the fancy rather than the imagination, what are we not doing to those sense impressions? Not imagining? Okay, we're not imagining, right? <laughs> True. Okay, well, just th keep, I keep thinking of it, so. He says, he says for it, it it's, it's vital, and all objects are essentially fixed and dead. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> so I guess, um, like, we're, it's just, the object is just what it is. Uh-huh. But with our imagination, it can be whatever we want it to be. Can look how we want it to be. Can feel how we want it to be. Can do whatever we want it to do. Yeah, I think we're we're thinking along the right lines here now, right? Yeah. So if fancy is just a mode of memory, right? Does our memory actually change the object in any meaningful way? Yeah, you're just remembering whatever the sense impression is, right? So. It, yes, it absolutely can be. <laughs> okay, uh, but I, I, I think that Coleridge is not necessarily think of, thinking of memory as deceptive or in any way creative, right? He's just thinking of memory as like a storehouse for sense impressions. And if you're employing the fancy in your creative work, then all you're doing is digging those impressions out of storage and maybe rearranging them a little bit, right? Yeah, it's like, going back to that, it's like you, uh, you observe and then in, you don't really meditate on it or at all. Yeah. You sort of apply it. Yeah, you, it exa yeah, you go straight from observation to application, right? There's no contemplation stage there in the middle. Good, that's a good way of thinking of this. Yeah. Um, so the fancy involves no real contemplation or meditation. You're just taking these sense impressions and putting them in a different order, right? So say, for example, um, you know, you go, to, uh, you go to a zoo, right? And you observe a whole bunch of different animals. It's pretty easy to rearrange that zoo maybe into a circus, right? You know, you've been to a zoo, you've been to a circus, you can just put the same animals into a different situation you're already familiar with, right? Without really changing anything. Now, if you take those animals, or your impression of those animals, and you start melting them together and making new animals out of them, right? You know, you take a lion and a goat and a snake and you make them into a chimera, right? you take a goat and a horse and you make them into a unicorn, then you're using the imagination. Right? Then you are melting down your sense impressions. Uh, Coleridge really likes chemical metaphors. right? You're dissolving and diffusing these different sense impressions and you're making something new out of them right? that hasn't been seen before. So, um, like, another way we might think of this, right? So say, you know, the fancy um, would be like, um, like somebody doing a cover tune, right? 
or maybe like um, if you think about like like you know um, a, a DJ in a hip hop group who just takes like kind of like maybe like one song or one riff, and that's what they build the the rap on, right? As opposed to a DJ who takes several different songs, blends elements of them together, and makes then something unrecognizable that's not recognizable as what it was before, right? That would be a use of the imagination. Does this make sense? Yeah. More or less? Better. Okay. <laughs> as long as you're better off than when we started, right? Mm -hmm. So, one thing that Blake and Coleridge have in common with each other, even if they're using slightly different terminology, is that they both see, and Wordsworth as well, I think, is that they seem to regard the poet or the artist as pretty powerful, right? I mean, you know, that, uh, you know, Coleridge, you know, says here that the primary imagination he holds to be the living power and prime agent of all human uh, perception, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am, right? So to break this down into human language, <laughs> He's saying that imagination is about as close as a human being gets to being able to play God, right? That the poet, as a maker, as a creator, can perform this godlike function, right? Blake is arguing that the artist, the person of vision, the person of imagination, perceives a different and better world than the ordinary person does. And Wordsworth is praising the power of the poet to kind of, you know, distill emotion into these new artistic forms. So, <clears throat> Let's move from here to the ne that next generation and look at Percy Shelley. Um, the End of a Defense of Poetry on page, page, uh, page 882. So can I get somebody to start reading uh, the paragraph that starts with poetry, as has been said, in this respect differs from logic? What did you say? Uh, page 882, uh, poetry, as has been said, in this respect differs from logic. Okay, so just pause there for a minute, right? So, Coleridge was arguing for imagination as being very much a kind of active thing, right, that we apply to our sense impressions to make something new out of them, right? Wordsworth is arguing that we have to, have to actively process our emotional experiences and our sense impressions in order to make them into art. Does Shelley seem here to agree with them? Yeah. Says it quite explicitly, it's not subject to the act, to the control of the active powers of the mind. Yeah. Remember that Aeolian harp, right? Mm -hmm. The strings simply vibrating to the wind. That seems to be much closer to Shelley's concept of what the poet does, right? It's an all, it, it seems almost like a passive process, right? Right, 
the impressions flow into you and out of you as poetry, right? Just as the, vibra the vibrations of the wind flow out of that Aeolian harp as music. The frequent recurrence of the poetical power, it is obvious to suppose, may produce in the mind a habit of order and harmony correlative with its own nature and with its effects upon other minds. But in the intervals of inspiration, and they may be frequent without being durable, a poet becomes a man and is abandoned to the sudden reflux of the influences under which others habitually live. But as he is more delicately organized than other men and sensible to pain and pleasure, both his own and that of others, in a degree unknown to them, he will avoid the one and pursue the other with an ardor proportion to this difference. Again, like, kind of thorny language here, right? But <clears throat> does Shelley seem to think that the wind passing through anybody will produce music? Why not, Jess? He believes that there's like an, there's something outside of you that's going to cause it. There's there's, uh -huh. there's something else in control. Yeah, I mean the the kind of music that heart makes, right? Yeah. Depends on how it's been tuned. Uh, I'm enjoying this metaphor. What's that? <laughs> I'm enjoying this metaphor. <laughs> Me too. I like I like this metaphor too. <laughs> um, and the poet according to Shelley, is not tuned the same way other people are, right? The poet is tuned to harmonize in ways other people don't. So even when they are forced to kind of, you know, live in the muck down with, down, down with us poor plebs, right? Um, they're not experiencing that muck the same way that we are. They're not processing it the same way we are. Right, that the poet is powerful and sensitive in ways that ordinary people aren't. All this being to say, right, that the poet seems to be, for most of these thinkers, a being of unusual power, right? They seem to associate poetry with having some sort of special faculty or power, right? You can do things other people can't. With images and with language, whatever, right? Now, <clears throat> I want to quickly look at Keats, who I think is uh, thinking along the same lines. as um, Shelley. In particular, this phrase he uses, negative capability. Now, I'm going to get somebody um, to read at the bottom of page 1016. This uh, passage, this, it start, the sentence starts with, I had not a dispute, but a disquisition. At the bottom of the page. Oh. I had not a dispute, but a disquisition with uh, Dill. Dilky. Dilky on various subjects. Several things uh, what's that word? Dovetailed. Dovetailed. Came, came together. Yeah. Dovetailed in my mind. And at once it struck me. What quality went to wanted from a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare processed so enormously. I mean negative capability. That is not when man man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable, you know, irritable reaching after fact and reason. Okay, let's stop there, right? And let's think about what this means, right? When a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, 
without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Now, how is this similar to what Shelley has been saying about the poet's um, abilities, say? Um, Shelley uh, said that um, it's sort of a passive thing. Both of them are sort of describing very passive behavior. OK. Just like. And they're both describing a kind of sensitivity or sensibility, right? And it has, it has, it does have to do with how you take in impressions, right? But also what you do with them. So the person who is possessed of negative capability doesn't feel like they have to do something with these impressions right away, right? They don't feel like they have to do anything to shape them. They're essentially comfortable with ambiguity, right? Comfortable with the wash of sensory data that they don't feel the need to force any order onto, right? At least not right away. And this is, according to Keats, the main characteristic of a person of genius, right? that the person of genius is able to let this happen without trying to force any kind of artistic vision upon it, right? So this later generation of romantics seems to be operating in that kind of Aeolian harp mode, right? This idea that trying to force things into particular shapes is the wrong way to go about art. We see this a little earlier um, in the letter here. He talks about meeting with this guy, Horace Smith, and his brothers, right? So Horace Smith, in early 19th century London, was kind of like the city, one of the city's kind of like leading literary wits, right? So he's one of those people who like was really, really good at combining words in ways that were shocking or surprising, right? He was also really good at imitating the style of other poets, but not so good at actually writing original poetry. And so this is a guy who, you know, like, is by and large uh, forgotten today, except by people who actually study this period. And Keats uh, describes Smith and his friends here. He says, right, these men say things which make one start without making one feel. They are all alike. Their manners are alike. They all know fashionables. They have a mannerism in their very eating and drinking, in their, meal, their mere handling of a decanter, right? So like, even like in the way they pour out a drink, you know, they have a kind of, they have to do it in a particular style, right? So what is his complaint about these people, right? What does he dislike about them? That they just, they like to say things that are shocking, right? And you know, they, you know, they're all in the know about, you know, what's fashionable, be fashionable behavior, and, you know, they all, um, you know, have to eat and drink a certain way. What's wrong with them, especially, like, given what we know he feels uh, is the main qualification of a person of genius? They don't have they're much wealthy. negative capability. Okay, yeah, they, they lack negative capability, right? And I think it's probably not so much that they're wealthy that's the problem, right? Well, kind of, you know, six of one half a dozen of the other there, right? I mean, these guys are relatively privileged. They're also phonies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everything they do is really artificial, right? Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. They don't have a reason for feeling the way they do. They just say no. things and... Yeah. In fact, they don't, yeah, in fact, they don't feel the things they say, yeah. right? They're just saying what they say to get a rise out of you. You know, and you know, their, their manners are perfect because they're looking around to see who's judging them, right? Yeah, they lack authenticity. They lack authenticity, yes. Very good.
Now, you'll note that sort of in the middle of the pack here, we've left somebody out thus far, right? Why do you think we've left Hazlitt out? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, process of elimination, OK, yeah. <laughs> yes. Good guess, or he is different, right? Okay. And what is different about Hazlitt's belief system? I'm sure you're a I was a little confused. <laughs> okay. He's more the reality, though. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, he is. Mm -hmm. Okay. How so? What, what's, what, what's, what seems more real about him? He didn't like the... I was a little confused. It's, no, it's, it's okay. Go ahead. Like, well, one of the best ways to get over this is to talk through it, though, right? Yeah. Well, I just felt like he didn't like the. It was a political paragraph to me. It seemed political. Yeah, he is talking more directly about politics. Yeah, he felt than like everybody else, right? threw too much politics into the poetry. Or it, or it was just. Yeah. Well, no, none of these other writers have really talked directly about politics or political beliefs, right? Um, you know, Shelley calls poets the unacknowledged legislators of the world, right? But that's the closest he gets to getting particularly political in that essay. What they are all talking about, though, is how powerful the poet is, right? The, so poetry is aligned with power. And that's the basic thrust of Hazlitt's essay, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the way we conceive of poetry, the way we think about poetry, you know, we think about, you know, the poet, as Coleridge does, as godlike creator, right? Then that aligns us with oppressive and autocratic ideologies, right? against our own interests, right? So uh, if we turn to his essay on Coriolanus, page 576, and um, I'm going to guess that none of you are familiar with the Shakespeare play Coriolanus, right? None of you have ever read it? Oh, you, you have? OK. So do you remember, Bethany, what Coriolanus is about? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I did read it. In, I think we read it in Britain. Okay. Okay, so Coriolanus um, is one of those plays that Shakespeare kind of adapts from Roman history, right? And Coriolanus um, is a historical figure. Um, he was a Roman consul who was um, uh, yeah, was exiled for treason, right? Wasn't it like societies and he thought different from those two and he got kicked out because of it. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the central conflict in the play is between um, the plebeians, right, that is the ordinary people, right, and the patricians, the aristocracy that Coriolanus represents. And so Hazlitt argues that most poetry you know, because the symbolism of power, the symbolism of arbitrary authority is so much more poetic than the symbolism of ordinary life, it tends to bring us into sympathy with those aristocratic interests, right? If we look at the, uh, <clears throat> the end of this, right, page... Uh, 578. The whole dramatic moral of Coriolanus is that those who have little shall have less, and that those who have much shall take all that others have left. The people are poor, therefore they ought to be starved. They are slaves, therefore they ought to be beaten. They work hard, 
therefore they ought to be treated like beasts of burden. They are ignorant, therefore they ought not to be allowed to feel that they want food or clothing or rest, that they are enslaved, oppressed, and miserable. This is the logic of the imagination and the passions, which seek to aggrandize what excites admiration and to heap contempt on misery, to raise power into tyranny, and to make tyranny absolute, to thrust down that which is low still lower, and to make wretches desperate, to exalt magistrates into kings, kings into gods, to degrade subjects to the rank of slaves, and slaves to the condition of brutes. So this may seem to us a little bit overblown in talking about poetry, right? But <clears throat> It's the same kind of rhetoric that these others are using in describing the power of the poet, right? Hazlitt is just turning it in a different direction, right? That poetry, as these proponents of the imagination, conceive of it naturally aligns us with tyranny and with oppressive power. And Hazlitt is the odd man out here, as we've noted, and he's a writer whose reputation uh, really suffered in succeeding generations as these other writers, um, you know, were on the rise. Uh, but he's somebody whose work was really kind of rediscovered in the 1990s and who's been slowly brought back into public consciousness. And I think, like, he's dealing with the same kinds of issues as the others, right? But his reading of their theory of imagination um, is, I think, an interesting kind of corrective or sort of criticism. And we're going to want to keep Hazlitt in mind in a couple of weeks when we read Thomas Carlyle in the Victorian period. Okay, uh, so does anybody have any questions about any of this? Do we feel at least a little bit better about this now that we understand it? A little bit. Okay, and of course, you know that you bless you. You know, if you have, you know, if you have further questions about anything or if you need something explained, right, just shoot me an email, and I'm happy to try to talk through it with you. So let me give you uh, reading questions for next time, and then I will put your contributions on the uh, timeline. And yeah, I like the yeah good uh, good analogy with the Taylor Swift song. I think yeah that I think that that works. I'm going to keep that. <laughs>